Oh, God. 
We're here for you, God. Help us to turn off the world, if not for but an hour. We just hear directly from you this morning. Help us to put aside the cares of this world and to walk out of this place changed. In Jesus' precious name. In Jesus' precious name. You receive that church. Give a little hand clap or something. I don't know. So excited this morning. We have, we have a special announcement. Katrina, come on up. No, her and Justin aren't expecting it yet. I'm just excited for this church to have an opportunity to sow into what's going on in Katrina's life and Justin's life and the whole family. And uh, she's going to talk to you a little bit this morning about what God's laid on her heart and the opportunity we as a church have to sow into us and what he has planned for them in the future. So Amen. listen to it. It is awesome. And then we're going to take up a special offering after this part of the service. Then we'll dismiss the kids and then we'll have the service. Amen. All right. Is this on? I don't yeah, it's on. It's on. So, um, Laura, uh, do you happen to have the video? Does it work? Or? Sound problem. You got on the music, but the computer's not problem. Oh, it's a little connection underneath plugged in because I had that problem over the weekend. I had to plug in the little AV cord underneath the computer. So um, I'm actually uh, I'm going on a medical mission trip to another Woo! country. But basically, how this happened was, um, we, got, we have three kids. We have Star, who's five, Alicia, who is three and a half, and Alexa, who's 18 months, and they've been sleeping through the night. I'm working for Centera Vascular right now as a nurse practitioner, and um, I'm used to that role now. I've been in it for almost a year. Um, the kids are sleeping, and then all of a sudden, I just felt like, oh, I had extra time to do some stuff. Um, I'm working on um, a theology degree with LCU online, and I just started getting antsy. I'm like, oh, Lord, I really wish I could go on a mission trip. And then I was like talking to the other doctors I work with, and I just wanted to be like, next time you guys leave the country, take me with you. And then I had the revelation that, oh, I could look on a trip for a trip on my own. So I actually just Googled this organization, and it sounded really good, and they had a bunch of other... Uh, trips to plan for next year to go in like 2021, not for this year. And uh, <clears throat> what happened was uh, I filled out an application, they called me the next day, and I was like, Yeah, I'm just trying to like, put some feelers out. And they're like, How about the next trip coming up? And I was like, I don't like being cold, I don't want to go to Siberia. And um, I'm pretty, you know, it, all the mission work I've ever done, I've been to Haiti and El Salvador. I'm like, I go to warm places. And they're like, we're not going to Siberia. We're going to Serbia. Would you like to come? And I said, I pronounced the country wrong and put it in a different region. And you still would like me to come? And they said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, all right. So um, I'm going to Serbia October 17th to the 27th. Um, it's totally the Lord because I would first it was going to be like a family mission trip and then I realized I can't bring my kids and I was like, oh, I'll go with my husband and the Lord said, what about just by yourself? And I was like, hmm, you would never go for that. And um, when I talked to him, I just came home one day and I said, hey, what did you think if I went to Serbia for a mission trip? And he said, okay. And I was like, all right, good. I already signed up. <laughs> so um, basically I'm going with World Mission Alliance. Um, uh, they're an organization based in Missouri. They've been doing it for 20 years. What they do is they build a connection in a foreign country with a church that's already established. And um, through that connection, uh, they bring a medical clinic short term. They also do clinics for refugees. They do clinics for drug addicts while they're there. Um, and I essentially, since I'm a nurse practitioner, would be one of two providers going. Initially, it was just me, um, which was kind of scary because I've never been to Serbia, and 
I would be the only provider. They see about 100 to uh, 150 patients a day, um, just seeking medical care. Um, so that's basically where the Lord has called me um, to go. And it's, I've always had missions on my heart, even before I knew the Lord. Um, I got saved when I was 19 years old from depression and drug use um, and alcoholism. <clears throat> and even before then, I was going to school to be a nurse because I wanted to travel the world. Um, and then when I gained a relationship with the Lord, I knew the mission was it. And I immediately, as soon as I graduated from nursing school, went to Haiti, and I loved it. Um, Justin came with me <laughs> I went to Haiti again in El Salvador. And I just knew I wanted to share the, the Lord's gospel. And it's like my career that I have right now as a nurse practitioner, it's not that um, I knew I wanted to share the gospel and it's either a desire that God has put in my heart to do, be a nurse practitioner or he's meeting that desire to make me feel, uh, you know, more comfortable to be a nurse practitioner. But at the end of the day, the whole point I'm going over there is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and work in his miracles. Um, right now, I, like I said, I work for some perivascular surgeons. Uh, they're surgeons that do uh, aortic aneurysms and amputations. I see a lot of wound care, do a lot of, of vein work. And um, Centauri is not a religious organization, but I pray for my patients and I've seen God move for them um, time in and time and again. Uh, I can't even count the amount of people that I've prayed for, and sometimes I forget that I prayed for them, because they'll be like, oh, you're going to pray for me again? I'm like, oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, under the constraints of Cetera, being a non-religious organization, I'm able to do it. So when I get to Serbia, everything's out there. They're already expecting prayer, and it's like, yes, I don't have to convince you this is happening. Um, the medical director, his name is Dr. Richard Bartlett, and... Um, he is actually one of the innovators uh, who's come up with a new way to uh, combat COVID-19. Uh, actually, uh, the new medication, it's not a new medication, but the new medication regimen that he's given to patients, if they're in the ICU and they're on their deathbed, he's seen them recover within 48 hours. Um, he's doing something that originally the CDC said in the beginning that you shouldn't do for a COVID patient. Uh, which is give them inhaled quote-unquote steroids, but he started doing it as an ER doctor and is actually helping turn uh, the medical field around. He actually had an interview with uh, Glenn Beck about two weeks ago and some other uh, modalities. So the person I'm going with is a pretty strong believer, and I think that innovation comes from the Lord. The organization is definitely Holy Spirit-filled. Spirit they believe in laying on the hands uh, of people and seeing the manifestation of their healings, which unfortunately isn't something all Christians believe in. Um, so I, that's, I had a PowerPoint, but I guess it's not working. But if at some point we get it working, can we play it? Because it took me like six hours to clip and cut. Yeah, I'm going to cry if we don't like today. <laughs> so at this point, as far as um, costs, uh, basically the whole trip costs $3,000. I have to uh, pay for the land travels, eighteen hundred. Uh, my airfare is about twelve hundred, and um, since I'm connecting outside of this country, my connecting flights are like in Paris and in Russia, and I'm traveling by myself. I'm also getting travel insurance. It's about one hundred sixty-five dollars. So, um, yeah, like I said, it's about three thousand um, dollars. I don't know if they're anonymous givers, but someone already gave me two thousand dollars, so it's pretty much paid for. But um, I just need help with. Pretty much I have enough money to get there. I need help getting back home. <laughs> I, need, I need help getting back home and the uh, travel insurance. So um, I'm about, um, I need a thousand dollars just on getting home. But it's pretty much set. I've got the passport. I have the, um, I booked the plane tickets yesterday or a portion of the plane tickets yesterday. Oh, is it working? Praise the Lord, play it.
three years ago, does anyone know who the Kleins are? Russ, Shekinah, and Yes, okay. <laughs> so, basically, so basically, I in the video, I'm playing something that they spoke over me three years ago, and it's coming to fruition. And uh, just a quick background, so about a decade ago, I was attacked by a pseudo-rapist, and I survived, and when I reported it to the police, they were really rude about it, and um, they never apologized after he was caught and put in prison. So it came full circle, um, but during this time when I came, uh, I actually just started coming to this church in 2017, and I started telling people about my story and encouraging other uh, rape survivors, and I was really just feeling encouraged about it because uh, for a while I was ashamed to share it with people. And um, when I began to share, it was just kind of funny that same year I shared, the police officers that were rude to me were going into their retirement. And uh, it was on Facebook and people were saying how nice they were and all the things that they did. And it really just, just made me angry. <laughs> it was like, yes, I overcame this, but I still kind of wanted justice for the way um, the police officers treated me. And so I was coming to the church and I felt like I was on fire. Like I felt really good about what I was saying, but then I just had this thing of like, God, well, where's my justice with that? Why do they get to go into the retirement when they essentially had left, let their rapists go free? Um, and then, um, you know, so I was dealing with that. So uh, the clients had everyone come up and we were just praying and he was praying for, I guess, young people at the time. Uh, he, he basically laid his hands on me and he said, no, I don't know what this means, but the Lord is telling me that um, when life is unfair, um, uh, he said, he basically told me that the justice I was seeking, that, that the Lord was just and that while life is unfair, the Lord is just. And that basically, if I would uh, let go of that justice I was seeking and give it to the Lord and turn my heart towards things um, that were of him, uh, that um, he would <coughs> basically um, set me on fire. He said that um, his wife actually came um, and Shekinah, his daughter, spoke over me and they basically said, you know, she also said, this is odd, but the Lord is telling me that you're going to be his spitfire. And what they didn't know is that every single occupation or job I've ever had, I get a nickname that basically refers to something that explodes. <laughs> <laughs> and literally, like, there's a restaurant, and they're like, you gotta watch out, Katrina, she's on hand, she's a spitfire. So I've been called that before, and they were telling me that the Lord was going to make me his spitfire. And then she kind of said that when I step down into, you know, he said, she said he's going to send me out to the nations of the world. And that when I step down and I spoke, that fire would leave my feet, spread to that country and spread throughout the world. And they spoke over me and they said that I would be a spitfire to nations. And that was three years ago. And like, um, oh, I don't want to cry, but it's going to, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was three years ago. And as soon as I said, okay, I'm going to Serbia, he brought that back up to me and I listened to it. And it's just like, this is what I've been called to do. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I modeled my whole entire career to do. I became a nurse practitioner for one reason, and that is to travel the world and speak the gospel in the name of Jesus and see his fire burn through everything. <laughs> what that PowerPoint was saying. I was just repeating what the Lord had spoken over me, and that's what I'm going to do when I go to Serbia, and that's why I'm speaking about this. And the next move is Justin and I are going, we're already making plans. The whole reason I'm going to this organization is to see how they do it and then reproduce it. And because in the next two years, Justin and I are going to go uh, part-time, full-time, but this is going to be our ministry. Um, we're also even talking about possibly partnering with an um, organization that Pastor and Carrie and, and Pastor Sean have already in Thailand and bringing the church to. Maybe, but the starting point is Serbia. Amen. So that's what I have. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I want to invite you to, to stay in up. I'm going to pray for them. An anointing on you. Uh, is it working? All right, let's play it, and then we'll do it. Then we'll pray for you.
supposed to be five minutes, I'm sorry. <laughs> anointing on you, this sounds kind of odd, an anointing on you to be my spitfire. Will you be my spitfire? God says it's so much more than you thought. It's just so much more. And it's a, it's a decision that you have to make. But the Lord says if you accept the invitation, you're going to see some things that you never dreamed of. I saw you, and you were going to different nations. And as you took a step down, fire um, started like spreading all under your feet, and it's spreading all over the world. And God is going to give you the fire of God, and it's going to spread all over the world. So God used her. Lord, as, that, as Kim said, that spit fire to the nations. God, just stretch your hands toward them.
Cause them to prosper in everything they lay their hands to. Camp your angels out about them and protect them. Yes. And Lord, we thank you for the harvest in advance. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Woo! All right. Well, this is from the church. And then if I can get, you guys can sit thank down. You. If I can get Mike and Noah to come forward, we're going to take up the special offering. Let, let, let me explain this, guys, because we are not allowed to pass the plate. Do not touch the plate. The plate is lava. Don't touch it, all right? Don't touch it. So they're going to hold it with their lava-proof gloves, and they're going to come down the aisles, and you just kind of lean over and put whatever you have in. If you want to give online, you go to the Give Plus app and go to Other, okay? And there's a drop-down of things you can give to, and there's an Other. Give to Other. Everything given this next week to Other online will be given to them. If you're sewing now and you want to write a check, just make it out to Katrina. If you already made it out to church, that's okay. Just with the memo, put Katrina, and then we'll cut her a check because this is a little different. This organization, you have to give to the individual, and then the money goes to the organization because of the way they're set up. So you don't give to the organization. You give to Katrina, all right? So we're going to pass the plates now. We're going to believe in a mighty harvest so that every need will be met. And then if you want to go online and give, you can go online and give. Um, let's pray for that offer. And Lord, we just thank you that every need is met, Lord. It's already done. And that she will be financially blessed as she gets ready to go so there will be no burden, Lord, that, that, that all of her tickets and transfers and she'll have money to spend while she's there and, and, and money to bless the people while she's there, Lord. I just pray that this offering would be blessed. Bless the giver. Lord, help us to remember the share of those that stay behind is the same as those that go off and into the battle. And as she goes off, everything she harvests, we receive an equal share of according to your word, Lord. I just pray that you bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's take that up. sensitive churches do, all right? This is a one and done, all right? One time thing, that God gave me this song and I gotta be obedient to the Lord. And believe me, I prayed and prayed and prayed about it. And I believe this song is going to speak to someone. There's nothing wrong with the lyrics, I went through them all. I, you don't have to come and tell me what the song's about, I already know what the song's about, all right? So. Uh, but believe me, you'll be okay. Lightning's not going to fall and burn up the church or anything. We'll be all right, all right? Because God told me to play this song. So we are going to play it. AJ has learned it. It is an awesome song, and it ties directly into the message. And, and I think it's going to speak to somebody. So with that, here we go.
anybody know yet? message a very different message and we'll be very transparent with you about some stuff that's happened in my life and, and and I'm doing it to help you understand heaven and what's going to happen when you get there and to help you understand whether or not you're right with the Lord so the title of the message is wish you were here and I'm going to start this message with a story this story happened about six years ago um, it was about six, eight months after my mom died. Um, my mom is the lady in the red right there. That's my mom. And the lady in the yellow shirt is Ron. That's my mom's best friend. All these ladies uh, went to school with my mom. Went to elementary school, middle school, high school, Divine Providence Academy in Pittsburgh, a big, huge Catholic school. Uh, they were raised Catholic, grew up in Little Italy. Uh, they're all Italian. They're all unbelievable cooks. So you want to get you want to get fat? Hang out with those ladies because they keep feeding you and feeding you and feeding you and feeding you. All right. Um, so they were all great women, very nice people, kind, would do anything for you. Um, and, and I mean, as people, I can't say enough about any of them. They are they are wonderful people. All right. And my mom was part of that group, and they would travel together and go on vacations together. And lifelong friends. And my mom was the first of the group to die. She died of cancer. And, and um, shortly after she passed away, 
Um, before she died, her best friend Ronnie, she asked Ronnie to look in on my dad and take care of my dad. All right, um, and and to you know bring some good Italian food over to him once in a while and drop it off at the house so he could have some good authentic Italian food. If you've ever had authentic Italian food, you will never eat at Olive Garden again. All right, I will not eat at Olive Garden. It is the worst Italian food on the face of the earth. I will not eat there. Once in a while, I'll take one for the team because Pastor Kerry wants to go there. So I'll take one for the team. But that is not Italian food, all right? So Ronnie took care of my dad. She really stepped up. She would come over and visit and sit with him and bring him food. Because my dad really had no one else. He had a couple friends, two guys that he would hang out with. But my mom was his best friend. And when my mom died, my dad was totally lost. Totally lost. Uh, 53 years of marriage, and they did everything together, traveled the world together, and my mom took care of my dad. I mean, really took care of my dad. So without my mom there, my dad was totally lost. So Ronnie stepped up, and she looked in and helped take care of my dad, sit on the porch with him and visit with him, and, and she was just a wonderful woman of God. Um, she was a wonderful woman, not sure of God at this point, all right? Um, so anyways, one day I was going up, I used to go up once a week and spend an overnight and do, do like all the yard and all that and help my dad out. And we lived about two and a half, three hours away. So I go up on a Thursday, stay Thursday night, come home Friday. Um, did this for like a year till he passed. He lasted about one year after my mom died, a little bit more than a year after my mom died. Um, so... One time when I was going up, like I said, this was about six, seven months after my mom died, um, my dad said, hey, we're meeting all the ladies at the restaurant, I'm taking them all out to dinner. And I said, oh, that's awesome. So it was my mom and dad's favorite Italian restaurant. Grace, don't make me cry. So my dad was all excited, and all the ladies were going to be there, her, her group. And they were all going to be there. So we went, we had this dinner, and all these ladies were there, um, except my mom. And during the dinner, we were eating and just talking. And Ronnie, I could tell when we got there, there was something, she was very quiet. And Ronnie's not a quiet person. She was very quiet. So I could tell there was something going on. And, and... As we were sitting there, she proceeded to tell all the girls that she had a dream a couple days prior about my mom. And she said it was a dream, but it was real. She says it wasn't a regular dream. She says it was just so real, and I haven't been able to get it out of my head. And, and she looks at me, and she goes, can you tell me what this dream means? And here's the amazing thing. God will bring people by you to interpret dreams. And this was a divine appointment. I was there at that meal to give her the interpretation of this dream she had. Because she had had it a few days prior, and she was wrestling with it. She couldn't figure out what it meant. She had talked to a few of the ladies about it. And this dream was very upsetting to her. Very upsetting to her. And she couldn't figure out what the dream meant. All right? So she, she stops the whole meal, and she says, I had this dream. And I was wondering if you could tell me what it meant. And I said, I don't know, let me hear it. And she said, I had a dream. And in the dream, your mom was there. And your mom was telling me about heaven and what heaven was like. Just prior to this incident, Sarah had a dream about my mom in heaven. And Sarah was really struggling with in missing my mom. Sarah and my mom were very close. She was really missing my mom. And Sarah had this dream where my mom told her, it's okay, I'm in heaven, and we're going to be reunited again. You'll see me again. And, and it wasn't a dream, it was a vision. It was a vision. God is amazing the way he does stuff to give us peace, to enable us to endure, and to get through the struggles of life. So Sarah had this dream just a little bit before, like a month or two before. And then Ronnie starts telling me about this dream. And she says, your mom was telling me about heaven. And the one thing she kept saying was, 
She is amazed at how many people she thought would be there weren't there. She said, I'm looking for so-and-so, and they're not. And she lists like 10, 15 different names. And my mom told her they're not there. And these were mutual friends of them that passed away before my mom, that my mom thought she would see in heaven. And none of them were there. None of them were there. And she's telling Ronnie about how none of these people they thought would be in heaven were in heaven. And she's saying that I found a few, and she named a few that were there, but all these other people are missing. And she said to Ronnie, you would not believe how empty heaven is compared to what I thought it would be. Not empty in a bad way, empty in a way that people she expected to be there weren't there. And then Ronnie woke up, and she shared this dream with me, and she says, what do you think this dream means? And immediately, the Lord gave me the interpretation. Immediately. And I said to her, the interpretation of this dream is for all of you ladies sitting here at this table. And if you don't get out of religion and get into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to be there. It's not about religion. And they are all steeped in religion, including my mom. It's about relationship. And then I explained to them how my mom got born again two weeks before she died. Two weeks before she died. And I had an opportunity to lead her to the Lord. I had been talking to her about Jesus for years. Talking to her about a relationship and not religion for years. And she never got it, never understood it. And as she was dying of cancer... And I was going up and visiting her and spending time with her in our last few months. We had some deep conversations about God. And finally, finally, she gave her heart to the Lord. And this was about two weeks before she died. And all the fear, all the anxiety, all the, all the worry of cancer, all of that was gone in an instant. In an instant. And she was ready to go home and be with the Lord. Prior to that, she feared dying. She was afraid to leave. She didn't want to die. And all of a sudden, she gave her heart to the Lord, and her whole attitude towards what was happening changed. And she was ready to go home and be with Jesus. And she became born again. Her heart changed. There's no doubt at all about her. And I saw her just a few more times after that, before she died, and she just kept looking at me saying, I'm good. I'm ready. I'm good. She knew that she was born again for the first time in her life. She knew that she had a relationship with Jesus Christ, that it wasn't religion. She knew it. She had an encounter with God, met him, and she was ready to go home and be with the Lord. And I explained this to the ladies who all went to Catholic school with her, all were raised in the church, all were very nice people. All on the cosmic scale, their good outweighed their bad. And they thought they were okay. And none of them knew Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. None of them. And the dream was a warning. You better get real. You better get born again. Because my mom's saying, wish you were here. Because she's not having an opportunity to share with you. Her faith. To know that they're going to be there. So God, because he's so gracious and loving and kind, laid this dream in Ronnie's heart to wake up that whole group of ladies. Now, I don't know if they laid heed of the dream, if they believed it, if they gave their life to the Lord. I would like to hope they did. My dad died shortly after this, and that was the last time I seen any of those ladies. Uh, Ronnie has since died. Uh, I'm believing that she went home to be with the Lord. I really am. Um, so what's the meaning of this dream? There's two meanings to it, and I want to share it with you. Number one, are you right with God? Only you can answer that, guys. Are you right with God? If he called you home today, 
Would you be standing before him or would you be in him? Heaven or hell lays in the balance. Heaven or hell. And then the second part of the dream, there's two parts to this dream. The second part of this dream is if you went home to be with the Lord today and you made it, would you have no regrets about everyone you left behind? Would you be okay with your effort in sharing the, your faith in the knowledge of who Jesus is with everyone left behind? See, my mom was a great woman. She was. And you can ask anybody who knew her. Everybody loved my mom. Every kid in the neighborhood came and played at my house to be around my mom. She was a mom to everybody. All the kids called her Mama McDowell. She was their mom. And she was that kind of woman. But think of the impact she could have had if she was a godly woman her whole life, sharing her faith and sharing the gospel. You see, my mom got it at the very end, two weeks before she died. She got it. What would a lifetime of having it done? How would that have impacted all the people she knew that weren't there? Didn't make it. If she would have laid hold of that gift and given it to everyone else. See, some of us are going to make it, and we're going to look around, and we're going to really regret who's not there, who we didn't encourage and pour into and share our faith with. This is a serious issue in the body of Christ, guys. Are the ones you love going to be there? Are you going to be standing there with regret? The interesting thing, the number one question I get from believers, this is a fact. The number one question I get from believers is, do you think we'll remember the people we didn't share our faith with who don't make it? Do you think we'll remember and have regret? And you hear people say, nah, nah, you're not going to remember. God says he's going to wipe away every tear. You're not going to cry over them. He's going to wipe away your tears. You know what the problem with that is? He don't wipe away your tears to eternity, guys. We got at least a thousand years to go to eternity. When you get to heaven, your soul is intact. Your memories, the story of Lazarus and the rich man are clear about that. You're going to know who you didn't share with. And I believe you're going to regret it. You know, it's a great song. There's no tears in heaven. The problem with it is what heaven is it talking about? Is it talking about the new heaven and new earth? Because there are no tears there. Or is it talking about heaven today? Because I think there's tears there. I think there's people there who are going to know they did not do what they were supposed to do. And heaven's a little empty because they dropped the ball. There's loved ones missing because they dropped the ball. And that's a little sad, guys. But the word of God is clear. He doesn't wipe away the tears, and he doesn't do away with all that until he does away with sin altogether, and we enter into eternity. That scripture that talks about that is as we enter into eternity. Not during the millennial reign, not during heaven in its present form, not during hell in its present form. Because we all know Lazarus knew it, right? He regretted it in hell. He asked if he could go home and preach to his brothers, right? He said, Father Abraham, send him to preach to my brothers. The rich man asked Lazarus to go, Father Abraham, to allow Lazarus to go and preach to his brothers. So we know that's intact. We know that's intact according to what the Word of God says. with any regrets. We do not want to get to heaven and look around and realize our brothers aren't there, our sisters aren't there, our family members aren't there, our moms and dads aren't there, the ones we care about, our friends aren't there, because we dropped the ball. 
and we didn't share our faith. Guys, this is real. I can't, I, 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 I'm telling you, when Ronnie had this dream, I mean, the power of the Lord rested on me, and it was like, you need to tell them what happened to your mom, and you need to warn them. They are not ready. They, if, if they die today, they ain't going to make it. And that's what that dream was about. People are fooling themselves into a false sense of security, thinking they're okay. They were raised in the church. They spent their whole life in the church. and They're okay, and they don't know Jesus. They don't. They're not okay. And the Lord talks about it extensively. So the question is, quick me to the next slide. Are you going to heaven or hell? Because there's only two destinations. There's only two places. Heaven or hell. There's no purgatory. You don't get to work your way after. You got one shot. This life is the proving ground. It determines where you spend eternity. And this life is but a vapor. It's over in an instant. And the decisions you make in this life will determine where you spend eternity. And not only where you spend eternity, where everyone you love and come in contact to spends eternity. Who are you taking with you to heaven? And who are you dragging with you to hell? Who are you giving that false sense of security to? Ah, hey, you're okay. You go to church once in a while. You wear your Jesus cross. You're good. Don't let anybody tell you you're not born again. Just because there's no fruit in your life. Don't let those religious people try to tell you you don't know Jesus. And people are dying and going to hell all around us. All around us. Heaven and hell hangs in the balance. And it's real, guys. And the decisions you're making today will impact where you go and where your loved ones go. Are you about his business? Look, I'm telling you right now, I really didn't want to preach this message. I really didn't. I'm tired of preaching it. Because I've been preaching the same message to you guys for two and a half years. In case you haven't connected the dots, I have been preaching the very same message over and over and over and over again for two and a half years. You know why I'm preaching the same message for two and a half years? Look around. Look around. Because we ain't getting it. If we were getting it, this church would be filled to overflow. If we were getting it, all your loved ones would be sitting in the pews next to you. If we were getting it, all your friends would be sitting in the pews next to you. If we were getting it, all your neighbors would be sitting in the pews next to you. If we were getting it, everybody we say we care about would be sitting in the pews next to you. We are not getting it. And that's why he keeps having me preach this message over and over and over again. And I wrestle with God. I'm like, God, I'm tired of preaching this. When can I preach something else? I got like three sermon series with rough outlines ready to preach. And he keeps saying, nope, don't preach that. Nope, don't preach that. Nope, don't preach that. I was talking to a very good pastor friend about it the other day, one of the guys who speaks into my life. We had lunch with them, older, older, wiser guy. Man, I said, I've been preaching the same message, and he's having me preach it again. And he looked at me and goes, when I got to my church, I preached the same message for three years. Three years. And I was in the same boat you were, but they didn't get it. When they finally got it, God let me move on. He said, I thought they were going to run me off because they didn't think I knew anything else to preach. But God's speaking to the church, guys. He's speaking to you. And this is our number one issue. And it's the reason why he's not letting us move forward. We are not getting it. We're not getting it. It's not about religion. It is about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you aren't in relationship and you're still steeped in religion, which some of you are, you need to put away that religion and get into relationship with them and be real about who you are and what's going on in your life. 
The second one is we are not fulfilling the Great Commission. We're not about his work. We're not sharing what we have. And we have to be about his work and sharing what we have. Because the Bible is clear, guys. The Bible is clear. There's one way. There is one way. And that one way is Jesus. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. Your religion won't get you there. Going to church once a month ain't going to get you there. Wearing your cross ain't going to get you there. Celebrating Christmas and Easter ain't going to get you there. It doesn't make you a Christian. Living in a Christian nation or being raised in a Christian household ain't going to get you there. Your works aren't going to get you there. Being a good enough person and somehow tipping the cosmic scales to where your good outweighs your bad is not going to get you there. Because the Bible's clear. There's none righteous, no, not one. Your righteousness is as filthy rags and no one is good. Jesus said, why do you call me good? Only one is good. Why are you calling me good? Man, your goodness isn't going to cut it. Your parents' and grandparents' faith isn't going to get you there. Stop riding on their coattails. And for some of you, your kids' and grandkids' faith isn't going to get you there. See, that's what my dad thought. My dad thought he did pretty good. He raised two preachers, a, 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 a preacher's son and a preacher grandson. And he's got a preacher daughter-in-law. Surely God will give him a pass. I've basically heard that come out of his mouth. And that's what he thought. He did pretty good. So, you know, you guys are doing a great job, so I should be okay. It don't work that way, guys. God deals with you one-on-one, -on -one, individually, is what the Word of God says. And you will determine where you go as to whether or not you heed the call and answer the call of God. You. Confucius isn't going to get you there. Buddha isn't going to get you there. Muhammad isn't going to get you there. They're all dead and in the grave. Only one raised. Only one was resurrected. Only one was an all-sufficient sacrifice. It's only by the blood of Jesus. He is the mediator. There is one mediator between man and God, is what the Bible says. And that's Jesus. He is the only mediator. And unless you lay hold of him in the all-sufficient sacrifice... Paul said we no longer enter by the bloods of goats and bulls. We no longer enter by the blood of goats and bulls. Once and for all was done, the perpetuation of our faith. Jesus' sacrifice was the one sacrifice needed. And in this age, the church age, you must lay hold of Jesus Christ. There is one way. And you have to understand that, and you've got to lay hold of that one way. This is a very basic message, guys, but we still need to hear it. Because we're either not speaking it to everybody else, or we're not living it out in our lives. And we need to get this right. The Bible is clear. Enter through the narrow gate. Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the great and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through Many enter through it, but small is the gate, narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Only a few find it. This word few here in the Greek is oligon, uh, oligon and it means, it's, it's Strong's 3641, and it means small, little, little of number, multitude, quantity, or size, rare. Rare. It's very rare that somebody enters the kingdom of heaven. That's how I knew my mom's dream was not a dream. It was real. Because my mom's up there looking around going, where, where is everybody? And that's what's going to happen, guys. We are going to look around and wonder, where is everybody? Because it's a narrow gate. 
few enter through it. How few? I tell you guys this all the time. So few that everybody that makes it in the end will live on this earth from Adam and Eve till the end of the millennial reign. We will all live on this earth in an agricultural society. You'll build a house, you'll tend to a vineyard, you'll raise a flock. We're not going to be standing on each other's shoulders. We're not going to be packed into cities. That ought to tell you how few. The word of God is clear. That's not a whole lot of people. And that's how few. Few enter in. Look, guys, everyone thinks they're okay. In America, there's a little over 300 million people. And 70 to 80% of them say they're Christians, depending on which polls you listen to. 70 to 80% think they're okay and think they're going to heaven. That's roughly 210 to 240 million people. Is that few? Is that few? That sounds like a multitude. See, it's few. And if you believe the polls where 20 to 30 percent are regular church attendees. And let me explain what that is now. You go to church once a month, you're a regular church attendee. Once a month, you're a regular church attendee. 20 to 30 percent. These are the holy rollers. All right? That's still 90 million people. Is that few? Is that few? Are they going to go? Jesus dealt with this and addressed it, guys. He laid it all out for us. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. I like the way the NIV put it. But only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And what is the will of God? That everyone would be saved. So what are you supposed to be doing? The Great Commission and the Great Command. Jesus made it easy. We got one task. Win the lost and disciple them. Win the lost and disciple them. But yet the overwhelming majority of people in church have never won anyone to the Lord. Or if you have won anybody, it's been years and years and years. Win the lost and disciple them. Win the lost and disciple them. That's being about his business. The Great Commission and the Great Commandment. Walk in love. Walk in love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor. If you're truly walking in love, you will love them enough to tell them the truth. In a way that's not rude and harsh. The Bible's very clear. Share the truth but do it without offending somebody. Do it in a way that's not offensive. Through love. So we need to be out preaching and sharing the truth. Even to the ones who aren't living a life where we know they're not going to heaven. You know, this is the issue with the LGBTQ community. This is the issue with them, guys. The church says love them and just accept them as they are. Just love them. Just love them. But the Bible says, tell them the truth and it'll set them free. They say the truth is offensive, so the church shuts its mouth and just loves them. And lets them die and go to hell, because they love them. If you love them, would you not tell them the truth so they don't die and go to hell? Right? Why are we keeping our mouths shut? Now you can do that with love. You can do that in a way that's not offensive. But we need to be bringing the truth because if we truly love them, we're not going to be standing in heaven saying, wish you were here. We're not going to be standing there saying, wish you were here. Love them. We need to be about his work, guys. But he who does the will of my Father, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day. Many will say to me in that day. Let's look at this many. It's pileo in, in, in the Greek. 4183 in your Strong's Concord. It means a high number, a multitude. 
a great amount. Remember who he's talking about here. He's talking about the church, guys. He is talking about the church here. Many will say to me, in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, I've done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare, I never knew you. I never knew you. See? It's not about whether or not you know Jesus. It's whether or not he knows you. You have to be in a personal relationship with him. He, it's got to be a two-way relationship, and he has to know you. The demons know him. Fallen angels know him. Satan knows him. Many of the heathens know him. But he doesn't know them. He's not in an intimate relationship. Many people in church know him or know about him. But he doesn't know them. He doesn't know them. I never knew you. He's talking to the church here, guys. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Remember I told you the church is full of sheep, goats, and wolves. Sheep, goats, and wolves. And there's going to be people that have been religious and gone to church and think they're okay. Bought the lie. Oh, I said that prayer when I was 12 years old. BBS, I'm good. I'm going to heaven. I'm okay. I was covered. I came to the altar covered in snot and booger and, and poured my heart out 20 years ago. And then I went home and nothing happened. They're the same heathen they were 20 years ago. And some pastor came down the aisle and said, just say this prayer and you'll get to go to heaven. And their heart never changed. Their heart never changed. They were deluded like my mom for years. For years. Until two weeks before she died. She thought she was okay. She was raised in the church, raised in a, a Christian school. She thought she was okay. But then at the end, she got it. And God changed her heart. Changed her heart. Many, many will say to me. The Bible is very clear. And this is a big issue going on right now in the church. I want to spend a moment talking about it, guys. Because we're being fed a lie in the church. People don't know their worth. Pastors don't know their worth. People are going around in the church believing there's going to be some big end time revival. That there's going to be some big end time revival and a multitude of people are going to come to the Lord before he calls the church home. And the Bible does not say that anywhere. Anywhere. I have asked people to show me one scripture that says that. And they can't. Because the Bible is very clear about what happens to the church. In the end, the church has a great apostasy in falling away. And heresy is preached within it. That's what happens to the church in the end, guys. I read the book. There's a huge falling away. Not a huge gathering together. It's not in there. And the problem with that is it gives people this false sense of hope. It gives people this feeling, well, we're just going to pray and we're going to wait and, and, until revival. Instead of being the catalyst of revival, the work is done. Get off your butt and preach the gospel. Don't need to pray about it anymore, guys. It's finished. Go do what he's called you to do. The reason why revival tarry is because his body isn't bringing it about. It is the church's responsibility to bring about revival. All the work's been done. Now that doesn't mean we shouldn't pray to get divine inspiration, divine wisdom, but we got groups of people in churches that have been praying for 30 years and haven't won one person yet. Get out there and win the lost. Do what you're supposed to be doing. The word is clear. The church is going to fade away in the end and go out with a whimper. Except for the real church. The remnant will be raptured out of it. 
they're going to be raptured out of here. But there's not a great end time harvest in the sense everybody's preaching. Or most people are preaching. As a matter of fact, the scriptures they point to, they go right back to Peter's sermon, talking about how in the end, that his spirit's going to be poured out, right? His spirit's going to be poured out, we're going to prophesy, dream dreams, and see visions, and there's going to be a multitude one. Yes, that's the church age! And for 2,000 years, a multitude have been being one. It is not at the end of the church age. It is the entire church age. That's the harvest. And we're supposed to be actively bringing in our part of the harvest. It's been going on for 2,000 years. It's not something big that happens at the end. The end, the church gets raptured out and everybody else gets left behind. And in that sense, thank God for the tribulation. Because there's going to be a harvest there. There's going to be a great harvest there. That's the harvest. It isn't at the end of the church age. It's in the tribulation. When people realize they missed it. That's the harvest that takes place. And then there's another end time harvest at the end of the millennial reign that's going to take place. But there's not an end time harvest at the end of the church. There's great apostasies. There's a falling away. Jesus is locked out of the doors. That's what my Bible says. Guys, stop believing the lie. Read your Bible. Be filled with the Spirit so when you hear that nonsense, you go, wait a minute. I read the book of Revelations. It doesn't say there's going to be a great harvest. It doesn't say that. It says the church is going to lock Jesus out of the door. It says there's going to be a great apostasy and there's going to be a falling away of the faith. That's what my Bible says. It says that heresy is going to be preached all over. That's what my Bible says. Know the word of God. And don't be deluded by it. Be about his business. Be doing what you're supposed to be doing so that you're not standing there in heaven saying, wish I wish you were there. I really wish you were there. Guys, none of us want to have that regret. The Bible is clear. We have work to do. And the reason why I keep preaching this message over and over and over again is because we are not about his work. If we were, this place would be being filled up. It would. Guys, when we were praising and stuff, the Lord brought this to me, and I'm going to share it with you. I've gone to churches in my past where I couldn't invite anybody to church. There's nothing worse than that. Because the church was so dysfunctional, had so many issues, the Lord planted me in one of them to bring about the change needed to change the church. And that's tough. Man, if you've ever been there, that is a tough road to open. When you're standing there and God will not release you and he's telling you, you be the one to fix this mess. That is a hard thing to do. People in the church hate you because you're making things change. They hate you. And you know they hate you. It's tough. And then you're witnessing to people and they believe you. (laughs) There's nothing worse than somebody saying, man, I need this Jesus. Where do you go to church? Can I come with you? And you say, Nah, sorry, dude, you can't come with me, man. Our church is a mess. You're going to need to go to the, here's a good church down the road you can go to. Has anybody ever been there? I'm telling you, Pastor Kerry's been there. All right. There is nothing worse than that. This church is not that church, guys. We have awesome praise and worship here. The Lord moves in the services. There's signs, wonders, and miracles. The preaching ain't bad. All right, it ain't bad. This is a church you should be excited about inviting people to. This should be a church where you say, man, you got, man, we love people. Come on, be loved. Get plugged in. There's no reason that you shouldn't be inviting people here. But yet we're not. We're not. There's a disconnect. Guys, and I'm telling you, You are not going to want to be in heaven saying, wish you were here. You're not going to want that. I am trying.
trying to get the, the word to as many people as I can. I'm not going to have any regrets when I get to heaven. I'm not. Jesus promises us the one who endures to the end will be saved. Matthew 24, 13. Are you enduring to the end? This enduring is talking about doing the work and completing the work that he has for you. Winning as many as you can possibly win to the very end. To the very end. Run your race well. Finish your works that he laid out in advance for you to do so you can hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Not what the heck were you doing down there. Now I'll let you squeak in. You're going to get by. Barely. No. Well done my good and faithful servant. That way when you're standing there. And you realize that people aren't there. It's not because you didn't share the gospel with them. It's not because you weren't impacting their lives. It's not because you weren't praying for them. It's not because you weren't trying to befriend them and love them and show them who Jesus Christ was. And it's not because you didn't give it your all. Now they still got free will and they can, but you're going to be standing there without any guilt, without any condemnation, without anything. Because you did all you could possibly do. That's running your race to the end. That's finishing well. That's being about his business, winning the loss and discipling them, and loving people. Finish your race. Don't grow faint. Don't fade away. Don't go out with a whimper. Don't go out with a whimper. Worship team, come on. You don't want to be left saying, wish you were here. You don't want to be left saying, wish you were here. Because you made it, but you can't find any of your loved ones, any of the people you care about, any of the people you were friends with, because you weren't about the Lord's business. Either because, like my mom, you waited to the very end and you didn't have time. Like I said at the beginning, how many people could she have impacted and taken with her? She waited to the very end. Two weeks laying on your deathbed in, in hospice is not a good way to wait. It's not. And I love my mom, guys. Don't get me wrong. But, but when I look at her and think of the impact she could have had on the kingdom, the impact she could have had on the kingdom, are you going to squander that? I'm not going to squander it. I'm going to tell as many people as I can tell. And I'm going to share my faith with as many people as I can share. And I'm going to invite as many people as I can invite into a relationship. I'm going to tell people the truth. Not the lies that the church is spreading around. Not that you're okay, I'm okay. Not that just say this prayer. Not that all you need is Jesus and everything will be okay. Not the churchy things to say. I'm going to tell them the truth so they're ready for it. So that they can have deep roots. They can grow and they can flourish. And they can be disciples and become a disciple. And win the loss. And then they go out and win the loss. And they go out and win the loss. Mark 16, 15 through 16. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. It's heaven or hell, guys. It's heaven or hell. So where are you going? Where are you going? Only you can answer that. Only you can get real enough with yourself to say, am I in relationship or am I just being religious? Only you know that. And let me tell you something. If you are... Why are you not sharing your faith? You should be so excited to tell people about what you have. So excited to share it. So excited to make sure that nobody misses heaven. You 
should be on fire for God. And if you're not, you better check yourself and ask why. You better check yourself and ask why. Heaven and hell hangs in the balance. You don't want to die and get there. Make it in and look around and say, wish you were here. Jesus, I prayed about doing an altar call, and, and I really wanted to, but as I look around the room, I don't see anyone here who needs an altar call, I'll tell you the truth. We're all believers. Where are the lost people? Where are the lost people? I know COVID could be an excuse, but man, people need Jesus more than ever now. Maybe I'm missing one. I don't know. Maybe somebody there saying, I need Jesus. That's between you and God. It really is. Ask him into your heart. Get a hold of somebody in leadership in this church, and we'll pray with you. Get plugged in and get discipled. But, man, as I'm looking around, we have got to get serious about this, guys. Maybe it's an opportunity for us to recommit our lives and decide we're going to go all in for God. We're going to get serious about our faith. We're going to start sharing it. We're going to start bringing people to this house and fill these, fill these walls and impact our community and help people to get discipled and help as many people as possible to get to heaven. We're going to play a song and have the video close.
no one's right to to, to preach a comprehensive um, not a lot of Pastor Sean this week, you know, all week, you know, just kind of struggling on I, I remember a, a story that, that they had on life care group leaders um, who, who spoke hard in, into our lives when we were young believers. And I, re I remember them telling us that they had these friends and um, their names were, our, our friends, our life group leaders, their names were, were Bruce and Debbie. And they had these, um, they, they, they came to know the Lord and they had they had these um, what do you call us they, they had these they had these um, there we go they, they had these, these friends and they came to him and said guess what you know we, we came to know Jesus we're Christians and we want to tell you all about him Bruce and Debbie said, you know, guess what? We're, we're Christians too, you know? And so we're, we're believers together. And they were so excited. And, th and their friends looked at them and said, you knew this? And like, you never told us? Like, how, how could you not tell us this? And, and I, I remember that story. And I remember them thinking like, here they were excited that their friends came to know Jesus, but they should have been the catalyst to, to bring them in. And, uh, you know, every once in a while when I, when I hear a message like this, I, I think about that. You know, I'm like, what a, what a great gift that, that we've been given. And we get to share it with everyone else. And, uh, you know, just w what a privilege that is. It's not something we have to do. It's something we get to do. You know, we get to bring other people with us. You know, I look at my life before Jesus, and I, and I look at my life now, and maybe some people in the world even think I've got a great life, but man, I know it. I know I've got a great life. And I've got a great life because of what Jesus did in me. So, you know, take Pastor Sean's words to heart this morning, and just and go, and, go and share. You know, tell someone your story. Tell someone how good God is for you and all that he's done for you. And, um, and if, you, if you don't have a heart for the lost, you know, pray and ask God to give you that heart for the lost and, and get around people who, who have a heart for the lost. And man, that, that's contagious. And I, I know a lot of people in, in here have, have a heart for the lost and, and some of us not, not so much, but to Hang out with someone who's got a heart for the lost. And I'm going to um, brag on, on Sarah a little bit here. You know, that, that girl, she's got a heart for the lost. And, uh, you know, if you're, you know, go hang out with her. I know Miss Bobby, you know, she's, she's just got a heart for the lost. I know many of you in here do. Um, but if you don't, pray for that. And, man, hang out with someone who's, who's got a heart for the lost. You know, hang out with, with Katrina and hear the stories, you know, of, of the conversations that she has throughout the day, and say, man, I, I want to do that. I want to, I want to talk to people, and I want to get, you know, bold in my faith. And, um, you know, you don't need to know a lot of scripture. All you need to know is, hey, what, what did God do for you? What did God do for you? Did God do anything for you at all in your whole life? Anyone in here this morning? Just tell your story. Just tell your story. Amen? Um, a couple of announcements. Um, I'm not going to repeat some of these ones that we've been going over, going over for a couple weeks now, but if, um, because I email them out anyways, if you're not getting our emails, just jot down your email address and drop it in the offering plate. And uh, when you do that, the ushers will take that and they'll stick it in their box and you'll get the... Uh, the email and you'll have all the dates and everything. Um, but a couple things I want to go over. First of all, if, if you're visiting with us today, or we've 
just welcome you. Thank you for, for joining us. If you've not ever filled out a visitor card, there's one in the seat back pocket. Just grab that and, um, and jot your information on there, and we will keep you informed of what's going on here in the church. Um, our regular uh, announcements today after service, there is a PMT meeting if you are part of the, uh, the PMT, if you will stick around after church. Uh, for that, we will have lunch for you. Um, next week, uh, we have an usher meeting after service, so if um, Holly has called you about being an usher or a greeter, uh, you will stick around for that meeting. If Holly didn't call you and you said, hey, I'd really like to be an usher or a greeter or learn more about that, well, you are welcome to stay. Um, just grab Holly, Holly, just wave to us there, okay? Grab Holly after church and say, hey, jot my name down. And uh, we will expect you uh, next week after service for that. Um, the Outer Banks trip today is the final day for regular attendees only. So if you're a regular attending and you want to go sign up today because starting tomorrow, um, someone who's not regularly attending might take your spot. Um, so starting tomorrow, if you have a friend who would like to come with you who does not attend here, we're inviting them to, um, to take up some of these extra spots so that we can fill the house and come on Grace and Jody and do the 25 today, right? So it's, it's a great deal. Um, and that's October 9th through the 19th, men beginning of the week, women at the end of the week, and then um, either or in, in the middle there, okay? Um, the Barefoot family has been working hard getting the, um, the kids' church room set up. Um, I will tell you, it is a superhero themed, and she is doing, um, Noelle and, and James are doing their great reveal next week. So if you've not peeked into the kids' church room, you still can't look. You can look next week, but um, she has been inviting us in to see what she was doing. It looks amazing. Um, so next week, um, all of the kids are invited to wear a superhero shirt, and I'm like, wow, that sounds like a whole lot of fun. And so we can wear superhero shirts too. So if you have a superhero shirt that you want to wear, you can wear that next week. Okay, so um, super casual next week, wear your superhero shirt and get ready for that, um, the big reveal. Um, um, let's see, next, what is that? Friday the 28th, we have women's ministry uh, movie night here. So come watch a movie on the big screen with us, seven o'clock, we're gonna watch um, Hidden Figures. That movie is rated PG and it was set just right across the bridge in Hampton. Um, excellent, excellent movie. Uh, I encourage you to go to PluggedIn.com and read the reviews on that. Um, I've watched it. I don't remember anything in the movie that should be shocking to you. Um, however, before I watch a movie, I always read the reviews to make sure there's something in there that I don't want to see. So um, I'm leaving that up to you guys. Go to plugged.com and read that movie review. And there's a link for that in your, in your email, okay? And um, that's it for the announcements. The rest will go through the emails. Yes? What time is the movie night? Seven. And um, with that, we will receive tithes and offerings. So we get our giver's confession up there, awesome. Um, and if you're ready to give, you can stand. And just as a reminder, <laughs> as a reminder, um, you can give online through the Give Plus app, uh, through the website. Uh, you can write a check and drop it in the offering plates in the front and the back of the church. Um, or you can mail it in uh, PO Box 218 in Smithfield here, Smithfield, Virginia. And uh, again, if you are uh, giving to um, Katrina's uh, mission trip to Serbia uh, through World Mission Alliance, you can put that under the other slot there in the, um, in the app, or uh, just write something in your, um, in, on your check there, all right? And with that, I will say,
say this together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I confess your word over this tithe and offering. As I do this, I say with my mouth and believe in my heart that your word will not return to you void, but will accomplish what you say it will. Therefore, I believe in the name of Jesus that all of my needs are met. Because I am a tither and a giver, increase is given to me. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Because my harvest depends upon what I sow, I am abundantly blessed and walk in the favor of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for the word that went forth this morning. We thank you, Lord, that your word has the power to change our lives. And so, Lord, we just pray that that word, as it went into our ears this morning, Lord, that it goes down deep into our spirits, that we would be changed, that we would never be the same. Lord, we pray that you would give us a, a heart for the lost, Lord. Uh, don't let Satan have the victory in this one. And, and we just pray in Jesus' name that you would uh, just let us know that, you know, it's not that hard to just go out and tell people what you've done for us. And so, Lord, I pray that, I just pray boldness over your people this morning, that they would go out and they would evangelize, Lord, that they would win the loss, that they would disciple them, that they would tell someone this week how very good that you are, Lord. And I pray, Lord, as they go, that you would bless them and keep them, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would make your face shine upon them and be gracious to them. Lord, I pray that you would lift up your countenance upon them and that you would give them peace, that supernatural peace that surpasses all understanding. We pray for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 